Hello and welcome back to episode 5, I think this is. It's been a while <laughs> since I've done the last one of this. My, uh, I'm still doing the PhD, I'm still ticking along with the studies. It's just been a bit of a, uh, a busy couple of months. I think especially, this is something I'm, no I'm noticing more and more now, is that I'm trying to do better about not working every day. Because that's what we're coming to in a little bit. I've been very drained from sort of processing material and writing material and coordinating lots of different bits and bobs. And so actually I end up working so much during the week that I end up having to catch up on the actual PhD bit at the weekends. That's why I don't really have much time. So the last couple of months I've been quite drained um, in terms of energy for this. So hopefully that can be fixed in the future. But in the meantime, welcome back. <laughs> Full credits. Um, yeah, this has been an eventful first year. It's now November, so I, I'm officially well past the deadline for the end of my first year, but it is going well. I, I'm hoping to do more of these going forward. Um, I'm more and more, as I will again come on to later, keeping track of my work week, week by week, month by month is getting quite a nebulous process, and so I think this will be a nice way for me, as it always was going to be to sort of have a journaling process for me to keep track. So hopefully we can keep doing that going forward. This <laughs> so is when the next one is like a year's time. Uh, with that said, the <laughs> a lot's happened since then. Lots has happened. Lots has happened since uh, <laughs> last time. The first big change for me is that as of the end of July, I am officially a PhD student. Um, I had my transfer process. Um, now, for those who aren't aware, when you do doctoral study, you get about nine months to a year, depending on where you are, to do what's called the transfer or the upgrade or the uh, end of first year checkpoint or the end of first year exam, whatever the different universities call it. It seems to be lots of different varieties. The idea is that it's a way for the university to audit the fact that your supervisor has said, yes, I believe this person is a good PhD candidate. And what it effectively means is that people within the department, and in my case, it was two lovely lecturers who are wonderful in their own way, not in my specialism at all. One of them is a 20th century, one of them is a early modernist, he does in lots of lift different bits and bobs. Uh, the idea is that they sort of review your progress and particularly review your methodology and approach. It's less about the content, but more about how you're doing this. And for me, it went really well. Um, there was lots of good discussion, and especially with them not being subject experts, uh, there's lots of sort of answering questions about specific aspects of, um, of content. Um, the biggest thing they raised was historiography and also schedule. Now, historiography, for those who don't know, I assume most people watching this do know, but, you know, got to catch all bases. The idea is that you're looking at how you approach the actual history. Um, and this is particularly in things like school lessons, which I'm teaching a lot at the moment, actually, or writing stuff for, is looking at why we think a certain thing about uh, an event. So, for example, the Second World War, we might have a particularly uh, Anglo-centric Anglo viewpoint, uh, or we might have a Franco-centric viewpoint, um, and that might affect how we write certain events. And I think that's a reasonably good summary. Please feel free to slate me in the comments. Um, the idea is that for my work, I should be being more conscious of questions of national identity. And a lot of my work is focusing on the 18th century military apparatus and the military sort of mili military civic relationship and what the military meant within society. I should like to focus on more on that. Unfortunately, as with a lot of PhDs, there is no actual historiography of what I'm doing. There's lots of historiography of adjacent. And what I feel like drawing at this point is a little Venn diagram of all the stuff that my thing specifically links into. Um, which is interesting and useful, it makes it very difficult to actually pin down what the historiography of the Fensibles is. Um, lots of different overlaps. Um, at the moment, lots about 18th century Scotland. I'm looking a lot at um, relationship with the different branches of the military, so the militia and the army, but very little actually on the Fensibles themselves. So it's an interesting experience. Um, the one thing actually I have come across rather wonderfully is 
more context for the early historiography of the Fensibles. Um, and at some point, I promise this for a year now, I will do for myself a good summary of my project. But I'm looking at this aspect of military service in the 1790s, um, that there were regiments arranged for home defence within Scotland. And because a lot of them were Scottish, not all of them, but certainly initially they were Scottish, there's been a lot of attention in Scotland. And one particular man uh, called Ian Mackay Scobie, Ian Mackay Scobie, I should say, um, <laughs> he spent a lot of his career after World War One. He was put in charge of forming the um, what is now the National War Museum in Edinburgh Castle. And he had a particular fascination with the Clan Mackay, which he was a member of. Um, and that included writing a history of the Mackay Fencil Regiment, which were called the Rays, the Ray Fencibles. And he did a lot of other work on other Highland regiments in that vein. He wrote about nine or ten regimental histories. Um, he did a lot of sort of other work, article work, um, sort of general integration with, with the community, really, looking at the Fencibles, because they're a really important part of Highland identity in that period in particular, less so than the regulars, because there were less regular army regiments who were dedicated Highland regiments prior to about 1795. Um, and so the Fensibles were, for most people, their way of connecting with the military identity. <coughs> the exception being the Black Watch, that's the only... Uh, the Black Watch, the Seaford Highlanders, and there's a couple others as well, but predominantly there are very few Highland regiments in this period. And um, Scobie's work is fascinating, uh, but is a little bit brief in its examination, and it's lots of reg it's regimental histories, it's, you know, A, B, C, D. It's not discussions of why those things happened, it's just this thing happened, this thing happened, this thing happened. So at the moment I'm confronting a lot of that, which has been fascinating, but yes, so transfer over went well, but that discussion has certainly, for me, taken up a lot, a lot more of my summer in terms of thinking about the wider ramifications, and particularly looking at originality, you know. I'm doing a PhD, part of the selling point is that it's unique and original. And so trying to make that argument um, has taken a little bit more work than maybe I anticipated. The uh, question is, why should anyone care? <laughs> um, but speaking of, I had quite a good summer overall. Um, I had lots of good research done. Um, I'm still pouring over stuff from my January trip to the National Archives, but I went to the National Archives in August in preparation for a paper I was delivering in September, which was about uh, sensible discipline. I'm particularly looking at the, the uh, court martial records now, but the lucky thing I should say is that because the Fencibles were technically considered part of the army, a lot of their paperwork got stuck in with the regular army paperwork. And so there's uh, boxes and boxes and boxes of court martial records, literally minutes of the court, of the court, literally minutes of the court and what happened. So it's, we called the witness, we asked the witness these questions, they said these answers, um, at the end, the court decided upon this verdict, and they're really useful. I've come back to them since, and there's so much more there to go through. Um, there's a lot there that's not been done, which is quite frustrating that no one's done it sooner, but there we go. And that was really positive. The conference went very well. A massive thanks to Zach and the uh, Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves Commission, if I've got that right, for the conference and for making do in the best of circumstances. Unfortunately, as many will remember, uh, Her Majesty the Queen passed away that Thursday. And so the plan we had for the weekend was rather scuppered by the fact that the National Army Museum, the venue, was requested by the MOD to be empty in case of need. So that was an interesting experience, but we made it work. And, you know, we had to meet up in the pub and had a really good time making some new friends, actually. That's my other big shout out is to all the people I've met there and I've managed to connect with since. You know, it's been really lovely being part of that community where I think for a while it was a bit quiet and particularly when I'm locked in here writing it's sort of I'm not doing that as much so it's been good to sort of be reconnecting with people. So that was positive. The other big news um, is that I had after several months of planning and lots of deposit money put down managed to get to Scotland with my now fiance um, for a, a five week road trip basically. Say road, road trip Mm. That's the wrong word. Research trip. We did we did four and a half days in Edinburgh, which went well. We did a weekend in Inverness, which went well. Unfortunately, the day I planned to be at the Inverness Archives originally was rather uh, interfered with by the, the Royal Funeral. 
So I had to reschedule things a little bit. And then the big bit of the trip, really, we spent a day at Wick, and then uh, I, I got to do some research up and had the archives there. And then two weeks in Orkney, and that really was an amazing experience. Um, it really was. It's such a wonderful place. The archivists were so very helpful. This is a massive shout out to every archivist I worked with on this trip because there was a lot of support I got from a lot of people. But the Orkney, they put up with me for two weeks asking every day, can I have this one, can I have this one? I went through the final calculation, 97 files, of which I took photos of 90, because seven of them, looking at them, weren't relevant or weren't, you weren't needed enough given that I've already got 90 to pull through. And a lot of them, it's very basic stuff. Some of them are very detailed. The biggest takeaway from the trip as a whole is that I have enough data points to be able to look at some examination of occupation of fencibles. I've got some data to look at um, location in terms of where they were from. And I have got a lot of data for average age and average height, which is a, unfortunately, it's one of those things, there's very little way of tracking health in that period you've not got regular nhs records they've not got you know monthly check-ins there's not a lot to go through so instead average height and average age average weight if possible but unfortunately they are are checking that but average height is still a reasonably good indication of broad trends in public health and what i'm hoping to do is to compare fanciful records to the army and to the civilian population and that then gives a rough center for how the fencibles relate to the other bits of the army and that's the idea we will see how well it goes <laughs> but that's the plan so overall it's a really great trip we did in the end 32 days we had to come back a couple of days early because um the dreaded covid rather caught up with us towards the end frustratingly but i got to go to i think it was six or seven archives over the 32 days and they were all amazing and all very helpful and i've all been wonderful to go through and see the material i've pulled out because there is some incredible stuff that i'm hoping i can make public at some point the biggest thing for me is that going to a place helps you get into the mindset in a way that reading about it in a book doesn't i know i was this more i think obvious than the Great Glen, which is the, uh, the fault line that runs from Inverness uh, down southwest to the west coast of Scotland. And it's an incredible place to go to, but I don't think I have fully appreciated how crucial clan connections were until we were drove down in. You cannot cross from mountain range to mountain range easily. You can't just hop over to the next glen. And so being cut off in that way does force you to co collaborate with your neighbours and that's why I see Campbell spread out all over and then I see close connections so looking at the grant fencibles he was, he's calling Mr James Grant when he raised it was calling in favours from his local friends because travelling much further than that is just not practical so I think being there and particularly being in Orkney there's such a strong Orcadian identity that I can begin to see why um, Thomas Balfour and his family raised the regiment there because they felt it was something they needed to do. And it's so strongly Orcadian, not Scottish, that was very fascinating as well. So it was a really, thoroughly great trip. Um, the biggest thing, takeaway for me as a personal note, is uh, getting engaged. That was really wonderful. I had plans to propose later in the trip, but given the weather forecast, <laughs> I thought I'd speed it up a little bit. I had been planning since May. And I got a couple of friends on board to check I was, you know, getting the right ring, making the right call, all the rest of it. But when we got to there, um, we went to Scarabray, which is, for those who don't know, a Neolithic village on the west coast of Orkney. It's a really wonderful space. And, yeah, engaged. That's nice. That's my note for future me that it went well. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that's my big other personal news, I guess. But yeah, moving on, I'm back from Scotland for about a month, I've been digitising what I can. The plan really next is to keep going through my digitisations. I have a trip to Dublin booked in February for more research, I need to get on with planning the archive material I'm going to be collecting there. That's probably something to get onto in the next couple of weeks. And the other personal thing is that um, now that university is back, you know, we're in the first semester of the next academic year, 
And so I've been able to get back to playing hockey a bit more. I actually have found a new hockey team as well, so I'm going to be playing a lot more of that in the next well, coming years, I guess, which is I really enjoy and I love that I've still got somewhere to go and be physical because sitting indoors all day is a bit dreary <laughs> after a while. I mean, but on that note, I also have managed to retake up wargaming. Um, over the summer, I managed to become closer with a new friend in the reenactment world, and we are going to be doing a 10 mil project. So it's going to be an interesting experience. I've started the first couple of models even yesterday, and it's an interesting experience compared to painting <laughs> 28 mil. That's so much smaller. But we'll see how it goes. And yeah, it's been, I think, a really good summer. I've managed to make a lot of progress. Personally, but also with the house, we're very much getting there with. We've started our patio. Hopefully, we'll finish it at some point. Um, you know, f fixing stuff generally around the house, getting it more to how we like, and then also making new friends. And that's been a really lovely experience. So, yeah, this has been a bit of a ramble. Hopefully, it will not be this long next time. The plan is I will try and do this probably next month before the Christmas season hits. And in the meantime, I wish you all um, a lovely autumn. I hope that the weather stays as positive as it can be for you. And speak soon.